welcome back to week two of basic business statistics. We spent a lot of time last week talking about numbers. And we focused on those numbers mostly in individual ways. We learned that numbers can do one of three jobs. We learned about the levels of measurement for any particular number, or whether those numbers were categorical or quantitative. Did they answer questions like, which one? Or did they answer questions like, how many and how much? But we focused mostly on numbers in their individual settings. What we're going to look at this week is what happens when we get a lot of numbers together and they start working with one another. A collection of numbers is called a variable. Well, what makes something a variable? A variable is anything that can vary. It can take on more than one value. A variable can take on two or more values. That is variability. Now, this is where people sometimes get confused when we talk about variability. Well, let's take this example. Height and weight. Are those variables? Well, you might think, um, well, yes, my, my weight is a variable. I, I've noticed it going up or down on the scale just from the morning to the evening. But my height is a constant because that doesn't change. And here is where that confusion can be clarified. Statistics is not about you. Statistics is about the group. So we're not interested in your particular score as an individual as much as we are about how those scores relate to and compare with other scores on that same construct. So in fact, yes, your height is a constant, but we should ask whether as we look around the heights of everyone in the room, is everyone the same height or is there variability? And the answer, of course, very clearly is height is a variable. People can take on different heights. The same would be true of weight. Here, however, we might have variability within, that's your weight at any particular time of day, and variability between your difference in weight from someone sitting near you. But variability is all about taking on more than one value. What then are examples of variables? Well, of course, height and weight, age, intelligence, sex, your level of anxiety, your level of aggression, some personality measure, something about your characteristics. Maybe the question of whether you enjoy your job. How satisfied are you at your job? That is a measure of job satisfaction. Is everyone equally satisfied? No, that is a variable. Now the contrast would be something called a constant in which every person in the data set has the same score. So for instance, if we were measuring age in a larger setting, we might have people who range from children to adults. But if we would constrict that range, uh, and maybe a better example would be education. Uh, we can find people with low or high amounts of education, but for everyone in this class, you are a college student. So your level of education is going to be a constant, even though in a larger data set, it might be a variable. And as we've learned previously, variables can be coded as numeric or non-numeric. We could write down the words yes or no, or we could code one equals yes, two equals no. Even better on an example like that would be one equals yes and zero equals no. One being presence and zero being absence. Well, let's put these pieces together. In order to apply what we are learning about statistical research, I want you to play along with a thought experiment. I want you to imagine that you are enrolled in a statistics course. Yes, you are in a classroom with 24 students and your professor. And your professor is going to collect some data that we could use in the course. Let's see if we can apply what we're learning. Let's start with a definition for subjects. 
The subjects are the individuals who were studied in an experiment. In this case, our experiment is going to be the survey being conducted in the classroom. The subjects could also be called participants. According to APA style, if you're using human subjects, we would call them participants. However, if you are using non-human subjects, like lab rats, then your participants would be called subjects. Or we could use the word elements, which might apply better if we were studying banking records. The data points collected from each subject, or participant, or element, are called observations. And if we look at the total number of subjects, participants, or elements in our data set, that would be the sample size, the number of subjects which we will use the letter N to represent. All right, let's apply what we've learned. Think about our classroom example. Who would be a subject in our experiment? You. You would be a subject or more accurately, a participant, because you are a human subject. What might be an observation that we could make about you? Well, your height could be an observation. We could ask, how tall are you? And do you remember the sample size for our experiment? Our sample size would be 24. We could collect data on a variety of variables. Therefore, it's important that we could be able to distinguish between our categorical or qualitative variables and our continuous or quantitative variables. So let's start with those categorical variables, which are also called qualitative data. Qualitative variables indicate an attribute or belongingness in a category. They will often be expressed as words. We could write yes or no to indicate two categories of response. Or we could say that the diagnosis was mild, moderate, or severe for an ordinal variable. Another way that we could represent a categorical variable is with numbers. We might ask a question like how many cars you have or how many children you own or whether you're in the control or the experimental group. The important point for a categorical variable is that the numbers are whole numbers or integers. We don't have fractions. So when we ask how many cars you own, it might be zero, one, two, three, it might be more than that, but it will always be a whole number. Nominal and ordinal data are always categorical or qualitative data. There is a special type of categorical data, which is called dichotomous data. Dichotomous data can take on two and only two values. You sign up for a course, you pass, or you fail. You have to be in one group, pass or fail. You can't be in both groups. You can't be in neither group. Did you vote in the last election? Were you a voter or a non-voter? Are you alive or dead? And despite what you might have heard from the Princess Bride, there's no such thing as mostly dead, because mostly dead is still slightly alive. Pregnant, not pregnant. Yes, no. You have to be in one category, you can't be in both, you can't be in neither. That is what makes this a dichotomous variable. So again, let's apply what we've learned. Let's come up with an example of a nominal level variable. Perhaps we could look at your class section. You are in section, for example, 901. Everyone in the group has that same section number, but if we do this over multiple classes, you are in section 901 that stands in as a name that is a nominal variable. Ordinal variables might be your class standing. Are you a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior? Other categorical variables. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Do you get up early or do you prefer to stay up late? 
What is your vaccination status? Have you had one shot, two or more? Have you been fully vaccinated? Have you had your booster? Are you unvaccinated? Other variables upon which we will collect information will answer questions like how many or how much. Those are quantitative variables, also called continuous variables. Quantitative variables indicate an amount, and therefore they must be expressed as numbers. The passage of time, 6.4435 years, or temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, IQ, or height, your GPA, your weight, all of these would be continuous or quantitative variables. They're answering how much or how many. And you will notice that some quantitative variables will have fractional amounts. But theoretically, any quantitative variable could allow for fractional amounts. Even though you couldn't literally get a score of 98.6 on an IQ test, it is still considered continuous data. And the question of how many is counts. How many dogs do you have? How many dog toys do they own? Both interval and ratio level data will always be continuous or quantitative data. So let's apply what we've learned. What would be examples of quantitative variables that we could collect? How about your height? How tall are you? Or the temperature, your body temperature or the temperature in a room? What is your GPA? That's a scale, it can have fractions. Or what is your IQ? How many hours have you earned in your major in your academic career? All of these are quantitative variables asking and answering questions of how many and how much. But there are other types of variables. We need to consider when or how often our data are being measured. So for instance, we could take a snapshot of the data, a one-time survey, or we could re-measure over time, such as a before and after survey. These are examples of cross-sectional versus time series variables. Let me start with cross-sectional variables. That's where we do a one-shot survey. Let's say we ask people, what is the most popular streaming service right now? And we see this bar chart in which the most popular streaming service is Netflix, followed by Amazon, followed by Hulu. Now, this information was true at the time that the data were collected, but it may have changed since then. It's a one shot. It tells us what was happening at that moment. A cross-sectional variable would include data that are measured at the same time. For instance, that one shot survey of the entire class. We could also look at sales for the month of January or a customer satisfaction survey right now. The gas prices this week or annual performance reviews for the year. Depending on the type of data that we have, we'll use specific research designs. The research design that we will use with this type of cross-sectional variable is called an independent or between subjects design. For example, we might be comparing the average height across two different classes who are taking the same survey. So let's apply what we've learned about cross-sectional variables. Here is an example of a bar chart. We have asked how many people scored an A, a B, or a C for test two. And we can see a picture of the data. The most common score was a B. Most people got either an A or a B with the fewest number of people getting a C on test two. Well, what about time series variables? A time series variable is measured repeatedly over time. For instance, monthly sales for every month of the year. Or we do a before and after survey. Or we keep track of gas prices over 52 weeks. Time series variables allow us to look for patterns. 
We can look for patterns in the past, historical patterns, or we could look for current trends, or we could use our time series variable for predicting the future. In this chart, we are tracking the number of people who have cable versus streaming services. And what we see is a steady downtrend in the black dots and lines for cable and an uptick in the number of streaming services in households. The dotted lines are extrapolating the data from the current trends to indicate at what point those lines are going to cross. So somewhere around 2023, it's very likely that more people will have streaming services than have traditional cable. What we are doing is predicting the future. How close will we be? Only time will tell. But we are able to make some projections about what is likely to occur, and we are able to make decisions based upon those projections. That is the benefit of using time series data. There is a specific type of analysis used with time series data called time series analysis. Or if we were simply measuring before and after, we would use a measure of dependent or repeated designs, also called a paired samples design or a within subjects design. All of these different terms for the same type of research design. What would our time series data look like for our classroom example? Well, let's take a look. And what we can see very clearly is that scores were high on test one, they dropped a little on test two, dropped more on test three, but were high again on test four. What we could be able to do is then plot those changes over time. We could see whether that same pattern held up in a time series analysis. Well, thank you for participating with this thought experiment about being in a statistics class. And I hope that this helps to solidify your learning about these very important concepts that we will be using throughout the rest of the course.